Welcome to Design for 3D Printing. We're going to share some tips, tricks, and techniques. I'm Mark Ebshire, Senior Application Engineer with CATI, and um, I've been doing 3D printing for over 30 years now. So um, I was right on the threshold when it started. So I hope to share some of the things that I've learned over the years with you guys. So we're going to build some basic uh, concepts uh, here. We're going to start off with machine capabilities, some design considerations, exporting the data, and then looking at the part printing itself. And these are kind of in the order of, of how we would uh, progress through a design. Uh, you often have to work your design looking at machine capabilities first so you can know what mechanical properties, materials, and things you need to use. So let's get, let's get started with that. So I'm looking at machine capabilities. You want to select the best technology for material applications out there. We're going to look at some different technologies. Uh, this doesn't apply just to uh, FDM and PolyJet, even though we're going to use those examples. It will also apply to stereolithography. It will apply to laser centering, a lot of other different technologies out there. And we're going to look at material differences and the abilities and or limitations of machines and some things you can do to control them. First of all, in all the technologies out there, there are literally thousands of 3D printers out there. Even home-built 3D printers are out there in the industries. So it always begs the question, why are there so many 3D printers? And, there, and what you're looking at here is just a few available from Stratasys. There's a lot more from Stratasys. It's just a few. So the answer to why there are so many is that every 3D printer has different capabilities. Each one has different materials they can run, as does each part with different applications, and each part has different geometries. So those are things that help you that you need to define to help you select your 3D printer. So if you're familiar with fused deposition modeling, uh, this technology was actually developed in the late 1980s. And the FDM re remains the most common method of 3D printing today for both the hobbyist and industrial use. So FDM takes a heated thermoplastic filament, extrudes it layer by layer to create a three-dimensional part. Stratasys uses the two-head uh, print head system with two different materials. The pr one print head is dedicated to the model material and the second print head is dedicated to support material. This is important because a lot of the uh, smaller or hobbyist machines, they will print in one material. By printing in two different materials, you can get your supports off easier, and Stratasys often uses water-soluble supports, so they will just soak away. And when you look at the polyject technology out there, uh, a lot of people are kind of scared about this. So they're not familiar with it. But if you have an inkjet printer at home, you're more familiar with PolyJet than you think you are. PolyJet uses the same kind of print heads that a home printer would use. The two differences are that Stratasys incorporates a z-axis so the ink you're printing out can build up layer by layer. And, the, and they also use a photopolymer that is curable with UV light or UV ink. And like the FDM, PolyJet technology also uses a separate soluble support material that allows you to just wash away the support material from your model. So let's look at some of the material differences out there. Here's a quick look at the difference between engineered plastics and photopolymer. If you're working with FDM, fused deposition modeling here, you're going to be really using thermal plastics. These are uh, plastics that are pliable often in there, and they're meltable plastics. A lot of plastics in your cars, in your home, these are all engineered plastics. And think about them as like a chocolate bar here in the example. It can be heated up, remelted, recycled, reshaped, and that's why we see a lot of plastics being recycled out there. Now, photopolymer is a little bit different. It's a thermoset material. Now, it starts out usually as a liquid, and as the laser, uh, a laser or an ultraviolet light hits it, that will actually harden it. It's like a two-part epoxy. The light hits it, and it actually hardens it. So the light becomes the catalyst 
for that epoxy. Now, once it's hardened, it is thermoset, and it cannot be reheated, and it can't be remelted back to a different shape. So once you take flour and you mix it all up with your ingredients, uh, baking powder and salt and stuff, and you make a cracker, you're not going to ever get it back to a cracker. You may pulverize it, but you're not going to separate the wheat back out of it or the flour out of it uh, later. So those are the differences between the material. And there's some advantages to each. Uh, of course, having something that's recyclable is great. Having something that won't um, burn up is, a, is good, too, for some application. And when you look at the different materials out there for fused deposition modeling, again, this is the one where you're taking a, a, a heated filament and, and extruding it. So you've got some general materials available to you. There's everything from PLA to ASA, ABS. ABS is probably the, the uh, most common plastic material in the industry out there. A lot of our car parts are made with ABS. ASA has similar properties to ABS, but it is uh, UV resistant. So if you've got something that's going to go outdoors and needs to be as strong as ABS, ASA is a good choice. You even have some engineering grade materials. You've got a, a polycarbon, a polycarbon ABS blend, nylon 12, TPU. Duran is our new material that's just come out. It's really out there for a, um, a tooling application because it has some lubricity like Delrin has. It's actually a mineral oil field product out there, and it really has a good slide action for tooling and stuff like that. And then we also have some high-performance nylon 12CF. That's our carbon fiber material, our Ultim uh, materials. The uh, picture here shows an Ultim 9085. Uh, that's actually, it's actually a vent that's used in aircraft on current systems today. The Ultim 9085 is formulated to be FST certified. That's flame smoke toxicity certified, so it is self-extinguishing, and they can actually put that in the airplanes now, and you won't see them when you're in a lug when you see the luggage rack, but all the vents that are behind there are often made out of this uh, Ultim material. We also have some uh, PEC material and some PEC ESD. That's electrostatic discharge uh, dissipative, I should say, electrostatic dissipative material. We have some specialty materials. That's our ST-130, that's sacrificial tubing. It's actually, you can make a part out of ST-130, and you can solubly soak the part out. So you would make this part, and you would wrap it in a carbon fiber or fiberglass, and then you would soak the uh, mandrel out, and you'd have a, a carbon fiber tube. Very, very often used in the automotive industry for race cars, things like that, where they're trying to get high strength and still reduce the weight. Look at your polyjet uh, material group. You've got uh, your standard Vero colors uh, and your Vero family in there for making materials. You've got some vivid colors in there. You've got tough materials like rigor and duris in there. And then we go to the flexible materials where we have Tango and Agilus 30 in there. These are really, uh, Agilus 30 is a shore 30A, it's very uh, flexible, and you can blend it with the Vero family group over there and the vivid colors so that you can get different durometers of stiffness. So if you wanted something like the sole of the shoe uh, to be very rubbery, you can have that and at the same time have the flexibility of the shoe for the uh, leather uppers and things like that. And then we have engineered materials, the digital ABS. These are great for injection molding and things like that because here again remember the material will not melt back to a liquid so now i can shoot plastic into plastic without having to worry about it melting in a high temperature material we also have a lot of specialty and dental medical materials out there we just introduced a bone tissue and gel matrix material for one of our special digital anatomical uh, printers and you can print um simulation of the same density and the same texture as bone, tissue, and gel. Great for our students and doctors that are doing pre-surgery planning. So now let's look at some of the abilities and our limitations on the machine. So we need to understand what these are so we can plan for them in our design or we can overcome them. 
So the first thing we want to look at is layer resolution. When you look at FDM and you look at PolyJet, these are layers that are stacked up. And in my picture here, my graphics, I've got this exaggerated, but I want you to understand how they stack up. And for the FDM, we can do everything from five thousandths of an inch layers up to 20 thousandths. So if you need something very, very quickly, very fast, 20 thousandths of an inch will get you that part quickly. If you need some really good detail, five thousandths of an inch will get you some detail. It'll take a little longer to build the smaller you go, but it'll get you the detail you need. Now, when you look at PolyJet, it actually builds in microns. So it's just, because we're working with a liquid, we can just get super small. When you look at 16 micron, that's about half a thousandth of an inch. You would take a human hair and split it eight times, and you would be able to get 16 micron there. So most of the time I build my parts about 28 micron. That's a good average for visual and for speed. Here you see in the layer lines, and it's what we call a vertical stair stepping. This is actually a part built on the uh, FDM, and I like to show it because if I'm testing a part, I will do a half sphere part like this because I, a half sphere has every angle known to man, and I can see up at the top as my angles become more acute uh, that the ridges become more out, uh, pr pronounced in there, whereas as I'm building up straighter, they become less pronounced. So this is going to be key when we talk about how to orient our parts. So remember this, how you position it is going to make your layer lines look different. When you're talking about polyjet, it also builds in layers, but any jetting technology, any jet printers, for example, they always build in dots per inch. How many droplets or dots do I drop in a square inch? So at 600 by 600 DPI is what we're dropping here. Each dot is about one and a half thousandths of an inch. So in a one square inch, you're going to find 306,000 dots at a time. This gives it just a superior high resolution across there. For FDM, for wall thicknesses, we want to sometimes in our designs, we often want to think about what is the minimum wall thickness. And this is true for all, a lot of technologies, whether it be stereolithography, whether it be uh, SLS, that you think about well, what's the minimum wall thickness I can build. Typically, it's two times whatever your toolpath is your layer thickness. So if you have a contour, a contour here is one road width or one contour here. To give it strength, I always want to have two contours. If I'm building in 10,000 layers, my contour is typically 20,000. It's typically twice as much by default as my thickness. And if I, so, if I want two of these, then I need four times whatever my layer thickness is, or two two wall two contours in here. So basically, if I'm building 5,000 layers, I can get down to a 20,000 wall thickness. If an engineer gives me a part that's got 30 thousandths wall thickness, I may find that it's better to build it at 7 thousandths layers. Otherwise, at 10 thousandths, I'm going to end up with a 40 thousandths wall on that part. So just as a good rule of thumb, your horizontal walls should be uh, uh, four times whatever your layer thickness is. So when you're talking about wall thickness, and a wall is 30 thousandths, you may find it difficult building that in 10 thousandths layers. But know that if we're building a part with 30 thousandths walls and we position it at a 45 degree angle, that's going to change our wall thickness to about 40 thousandths. And now I can build 40 thousandths easily on there. And of course, we all love trig. So there's the trig formula down there, the sine of 45 degrees, almost one and a half times 30 will give you 40 thousandths in there. So, Position on angle can also increase your wall thickness and make it easier to build. And we're going to be talking more about how to build on an angle and some tricks and techniques with that in a minute. But I want to look at the minimum wall thickness on PolyJet also. With a 600 by 600 DPI and 1600 in the Z dots per inch, you're going to get very, very fine droplets in there. But you're going to be limited 
by the cleaning process. And this is something I found out the hard way. If you use a water jet to blow out the supports in there, it's going to blow out the pot. However, we do have some soluble support material that's uh, been around for quite a while, and now we can soak those supports, supports out of there. So soaking them out, and then maybe use coming back with a tube, toothbrush to brush that out, you can get a very fine, detailed part. Now, this is something that I run across when I was uh, working at an aerospace company, and it has to do with machine accuracy. The first time I ran up against this problem, I thought my machine accuracy had a problem, but it turned out it's not machine accuracy, it's geometry accuracy. And let me show you the difference in this. I was making airfoils for wind tunnel models, and so the scale is very important when you're making those, and of course your airfoils come out to a sharp knife edge. So this is a simple part, it's four inches long with a five degree angle. If you build that, with default, this is an FDM extrusion, for example, you're going to see that it doesn't quite come to the point. The red is my CAD uh, on there, and you can see that my tool path is going to run short of what my intended path is. So when you look at this and you want to trip this out, you're going to find that the formula there, the contour width times the tangent radius, it's going to be 0.21864. But I will tell you this, we don't all love trig, so if you actually want to just draw it out in CAD, you'll get the same answer. If you said I've got this five degree angle, four inches long, and you put your 20 thousandths radius, because that's my default radius, uh, default diameter, not radius, diameter, with the extrusion, you'll see that I'm about a quarter, a little less than a quarter inch short. And the first time I did this uh, on a wind tunnel model, I'm going, Whoa, I'm a half inch short overall, with well, a quarter inch short on each end. This is an important uh, thing to know. And I thought my machine had a problem, but it's actually a geometry limitation here by how big you can draw. So let's talk about a couple of ways to overcome that. First way is to extend it. You can extend that if you know your 20 thousandths, you can draw your CAD with 20 thousandths uh, wall thickness here all the way out to the full length, and now when you draw it with the 20 thousandths path, you're going to end up with a full extension on there. So you will make, now you may have to take some sandpaper and sand that down to a sharp razor edge if you need it, but remember 20 thousandths, that's about five human hairs. You're going to, you're not really going to see a lot of that anyway. The other one is a filtered uh, solution. So some of the uh, uh, software out there that uh, prepares the files will let you add a filter in there. With a filtered solution, it will say go ahead and draw it, and it even draws it with two lines in here for the full path. It says that don't ignore it, go ahead and draw it to the full length, and it will draw that part for me and make that uh, a full extension. So here if you want to see what those parts look like while they're built, uh, I call them DEF, Default Extended and Filtered not because part A, B, and C was already taken, but they came out D, E, F. So there's a um, three inches. You can see it's a little under a quarter of an inch there. That's my default. You can see what it looks like when I extend it. I can sand that down easily to a point. I'm a little bit thicker on my filter because it's putting two uh, contours for strength in there, but I can sand that one down to a knife edge also. So know that Sometimes you think the machine has an error that it really can be the geometry itself and a limitation of what the machine can draw. So now we've been building angles, let's talk about some self-supporting angles. And let's look at FDM. So what is the largest angle that I can build without supports? In other words, how far can I extend out before my layer starts to fall down here? If my layer falls down, I need to support under there. So how far can I build that without falling down? So I modeled up this sample part. I took it from 65 degrees in five degree increments down to 20 degrees. And I said, okay, I'm gonna build that part just like you see it uh, face uh, down the platform there without any supports and let's see how it comes out. When I built that part, here you can see it, you can see that all the way up to 45 degrees, I'm looking good 
when I get down to 40, I'm up, I have 45. I get down to 40, I'm starting to get a little ragged. Now, I really get ragged out here at 20 degrees. I'm surprised it didn't crash. But it did build, but it's, it's very ragged because my supports uh, uh, are needed for this. The default is about 43 degrees, but by building this sample part, I know I can get away with about 40 degrees without any support underneath my part. So I said, okay, let me build another part and just take a look at it. So notice that this part looks a lot better. And I built this with no supports also, but notice this support looks a lot better even at 20 degrees. The difference on this one is that the red one is built at 10,000 slayers and the blue one is built at 7,000 slayers. Because I'm building thinner layers, they don't extend out as far, therefore I require less support. Now, it may take me a little bit longer to build, but if I don't have to spend the time cleaning, I can even go as far as 20 degrees of 7,000 slayers, and these are both built with ABS material. So my next question becomes, how large of a hole can I build without supports, especially a horizontal hole uh, like this? How far can I build that without supports? Because I just need to build a big hole to run wires through or tubing through, and I really don't care about the finish on the inside, but I don't want to spend my time taking out a bunch of support material. So I modeled up this part, part that has everything from a 1 8 inch hole to a 1 inch hole by 1 8 inch uh, increments. And I ran that standing up, and here you can see this is 10,000 slayers. You can see for an 8 inch hole, I'm really pretty good. I can build, I don't really need supports for that. So in my software, I could edit that out. Even at 1 inch, you'll see it sagging. Now notice that we're talking about building at an angle a circle or a hole like this is really just a series of angles coming out. And as I flatten out across the top, my angle becomes more acute. Then I do need more support right here. But if I'm just running electrical wiring or something through that on the inside of the part, I may not be concerned with it and may be able to get by without it. There are some alternatives out there. Instead of building a hole, you could do a diamond shape and have no supports in there and then that would help a lot. Also notice that the lettering here was built with no supports, and yet it's crisp enough and legible and readable. The secret of that, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, lettering later on, is that I only went in one um, road width. Remember our road width we said was 20 thousandths on a 10 thousandths layer? So if I'm only 20 thousandths deep, I can actually span without a support by one layer uh, one road width in there. When you look at the detail on PolyJet, on PolyJet, uh, you can get so much thinner on your on your parts, uh, on your hole size, things like that, because uh, of the DPI and dots per inch. Here you can see that we're looking at holes that are thirty thousandths in there. When you start getting smaller than that, you may want to start wringing them out, uh, touching them up with a drill, something like that. Also, it's important to note that about 5,000 clearance is the minimum that you want if you're going to be making uh, those posts to go into holes like that. So just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about clearance later on also in our design uh, consideration. Remember on PolyJet, because you're using droplets on there off the printhead, everything that's overhanging must be supported. But we can do very intricate parts with soluble supports. Isaac Newton kind of um, messed this up when he made gravity a law. So because it's a law, everything has to be supported here. When you look at surface finish on your polyjet, because everything that overhangs has to be supported, you, will ha you can have a glossy surface on top of a part, and you'll have a matte finish where the supports are. So when you clean that part, as you see in the second picture here, you're going to have a matte finish. Now that matte finish, it can be uh, sanded and polished and look just as good as the top. If you need a crystal clear ball, you can certainly sand that up and buff it, polish it and buff it. If you just need consistency for color on your part, you can tell it to build the supports and have a matte finish on top. All the matte finish does is add a fine, small layer 
of support material on there so it easily washes away, but you'll have a consistency on there. So you don't always necessarily need glossy, but you can have consistency of color uh, in your part. So you can have adjust your surface finish in the PolyJet. So that was all about machine capabilities. Let's look at some design considerations, see what we learned about applying the angles and how we can build an angle. We're also going to look at threads. That's a common question people ask, how about threads? And then a detail and lettering and part clearance. These are just some things we're going to cover. We can't possibly cover them all. So self-supporting angles, first thing. We saw that we could build this at a 45 degree angle. Uh, without having any supports in our design. So let's apply that to our design. This is an actual end of arm tooling, a piece of an end of arm tooling. And in this big square channel, all that goes in there are vacuum tubes, and electrical uh, switch lines, uh, cords, things like that to go and pick up a, a robotic pickup tool. But if you built the part like this, you're going to have supports. And this is the way we would normally design in our mechanical world that we think about. But if you change the design, for example, and just change the angle on here, just a 45 degree angle, and you built this part, you'll see a dramatic difference in here of less supports, less material, less labor costs, and a faster build time. So how we design for 3D printing makes a big difference. I even have supports under my gussets here, where there's a gusset on a 45 degree angle, no supports, only on this tangent line do I have a support, and that is easily removed, breaking away, nothing inside. I don't have to soak the supports out. I just take it off and go to work using it. So how we take that self-supporting angle and apply it to our design can make a huge difference. Let's look at threads for FDM. Your heat set inserts will really work well on there. You can uh, heat them up and insert uh, threads in there. If you print your threads, Make sure that you have a rounded root and the crest on the thread. Uh, a lot of people, if you're drawing and you don't, you leave your six degree out to a full uh, angle, that's going to cause some cracking in there. Uh, the, the radius has helped mitigate cracking. Uh, you can also make it a little undersized, and you can drill and tap it after the printing. You could just do the hole and actually uh, tap the, the hole also in there. One thing you can also do for threading is insert the hardware during the FDM build. Here you can see a part where a hex nut was uh, in here with our advanced software. We could uh, pause the build, take out the supports in the software, and insert a nut. So if I'm putting one parallel to the base, I, I would put a hex nut in there. For square, to the, uh, for a perpendicular to my base, I use a square nut. That way I have a full square surface to build on top of. And I can even build the, uh, take some bolts and make my thumb screws embedded in there for that also. Threads for polyjet, uh, you don't necessarily want to use heat uh, poly, uh, thread, heat, heated inserts in this. And the reason is because polyjet doesn't melt back to a liquid when it's heated up. So no heat set inserts in it. You can print the threads in there. Uh, it's always good to chase them. And you can put wire coils in there, keen search, other things like that. If you need, they go in and out a bunch of times. Fine detail and lettering. Remember FDM, different layers have different contour widths or road widths. So you're going to be limited to how thick your lettering is. If you're using a, a 20,000th road width and you want to dot an eye, you're going to have a problem dotting the eye with that necessarily. So orientation for FDM, always face up is the best. I have seen a few cases where face down works well too. And the sidewall is always good if you're only one road width deep on the sidewall, as I showed you in our previous example. For PolyJet, when you're looking at a resolution of 600 by 600 DPI, your orientation, always facing up is the best for a glossy finish. If you don't care about the finish and you use a matte sort finish, any surface works well with PolyJet because it's doing such small micron layers, it will work and look well. Engraved or embossed text, I uh, personally prefer the engraved text. I find that filling in around it is often much more accurate, much more legible. 
than actually trying to fill the letter itself in. But stick with about 20 thousandths, 20 thousandths high on your uh, feature size and your thickness of your letter. Also, one thing to be aware of is you can use any true type font that's in your Windows folder, but it's always a good to avoid serif fonts. The serif is a little tick mark like you see on the a Roman uh, serif there, a little tick mark that's on the eye on each side. You want to avoid those small little ones in there, especially if you're using FDM. It's, it's hard to draw those. So go with the sans serif. Sans is Latin for without, so without serif for your aerial is better. And also avoid a script or a calligraphy uh, in there because they have small little paths in there that are tough. So I personally find that Comics Sans and your aerial fonts are really good because they have a consistent width as you look at those fonts. So park clearance. Park clearance is always subject to your design. It depends on how much flexibility and bendability you want in your design by how much clearance you add. But I will give you some minimums and some examples there. So I, a lot of times you'll see that 20 thousandths is recommended. I found that even down to 15 thousandths works well. You can see a chain mail here in both examples, and these were all printed together at one time with about 15 thousandths. Uh, clearance between them in there. Let's look at ex uh, an export, exporting uh, our data in here. We want to understand the STL format. That's the most common one out there. And we want to look at shells and assemblies at the same time. So the STL format, when you look at computer-aided design, uh, these are all uh, mathematical formulas. They're parametric in our design. But when you convert to an STL, surface tessellation, tessellation language, you cannot uh, have the parametric values anymore. Uh, so but all CAD packages out there have translators pretty much to export to an STL format. So the STL format is just going to be a mesh. Your CAD needs to be a three-dimensional solid model, watertight. You can't just do a surface model because a surface model doesn't have any volume or thickness to it. Units uh, can be inches or millimeters, either one. And if you convert your CAD to an STL, it's just going to make a mesh of triangles or tessellations to approximate the surface. So here you can see on the cube, it really is made up of 12 triangles. So let's take a look at just one of those triangles and see and study it a little bit. The triangle is defined in a 3D coordinate space by the triangle point. You can see vertex 1, 2, and 3. They're defined in an X, Y, and Z uh, space out there, and that's what defines that triangle. You also have a face on your triangle. The face needs to always be facing out. That's called a facet normal. If it's not facing out, it's a reverse triangle and some technologies have a problem, like stereolithography, for example, will have a problem and not be able to build that triangle if it's not facing out. Most software packages have gotten much better, and you don't see this problem a lot. But there are third-party softwares that can fix it. You also get a choice when you're saving your STL file whether you want to save in an ASCII format or you want to save in a binary format. Your ASCII format, you can actually read in a, um, a notepad. Your binary format is about six times smaller in there. So here's what, so save it by binary, this is your default. If you looked at this cube in an ASCII format, you can see exactly where every triangle vert vertice is located in XYZ space and facing normals here, which way they're facing out from the back or facing to the front. You can read this in Notepad. You might have to be Rain Man to uh, actually edit it, um, but you're not going to be able to really do much with it. And like I can say it is six times larger. So be sure you're trying to always use the binary on that. CAD resolution. This is important because you're only going to build parts as good as you can um, produce in your model. So if you build your part too coarse, your CAD file too coarse, 
your model is going to come out looking coarse. And you can go too fine where the resolution uh, is just so fine in there that the file becomes huge. You can also look at your STL file and you can tell by the last two digits, 34 or 84, if that file is going to be a corrupt file. If it doesn't end in 34 and 84, because of the number of headers, the box, and the box for each triangle, you'll always end up with this and you'll know that you have a problem. So saving an STL file, and I'm going to use SOLIDWORKS as an example. It's pretty common with ProEngineer, anything else that you're going to use out there. But we want to save in SOLIDWORKS, it'll be File, Save As, you use the STL pull-down. And a lot of people forget that there's an Options tab here. So look at that Options tab, and when you pull it up, you're going to get some choices between Coarse, Fine, and Custom. And notice how polygonized polygon this is out here on the on the shape. That's your course. As you start and look at custom, you can now change your to two thousandths of an inch, three degrees is what I use most common, and it now makes it a much rounder shape and you'll end up with a better resolution for your STL. One thing to be aware of though, especially in SOLIDWORKS, is that if you're outputting your STL here, before I do that, let me mention that this is what your settings mean, by the way. Your deviation is your cord uh, height in here. So your cord height is the deviation. The smaller you get on your deviation, the smaller these triangles will be across here in width. Your angle tolerance is the angle around a radius from one triangle to the other. And the smaller you get, the closer it will close your deviation also in there. Now, when you're setting your uh, options, you can do a coarse, a fine, and a custom. When you do the coarse, you're going to see your triangles are large. Even if you do a fine, you can see your triangles in here. And a custom, you're going to see that it's not quite as uh, uh, fine. It's very good resolution. So what I'm getting at is, if it is a good rule of thumb for your 3D printing. If you can count the triangles, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, if you can count the triangles on here, then you're not going to be happy with the part that's going to be output. I can even count these triangles, and I can count the triangles around this surface. Here, I'm not even going to bother counting them, but if you can count the triangles across that radius, you won't be happy with the part. Image quality. I point this out because when you're saving your uh, settings in uh, SOLIDWORKS for your STL file, this screen looks very similar, but it does not set the STL resolution. So if you increase your image setting thinking, oh, I'm getting a rounder part, you're really not. You're just slowing down your screen on regenerating the screen for your build part. So don't think that necessarily, on, especially in SOLIDWORKS, that your image setting, uh, it looks like a similar screen, but it's not the same as your settings for your STL file. Now let's look at shells and assemblies. A shell in a 3D printing world is what SOLIDWORKS or what CAD packages would define as a body. So shells and bodies are almost interchangeable. In CAD, we call a shell hollowing it out. In 3D printing, you have to print at least one shell. Every part needs to have one shell. Now assemblies can be made of multiple shells, and that's to different uh, material properties. An example is uh, something like this. Your shells need to be merged together. If you did a cross section of this, you would see that this is actually an unmerged shell. It's just a shaft going into a block. This creates a problem. Just taking one slice and drawing this out in FDM, you will end up with a part that is hollow in the center when you don't want that. FDM is going to recognize that boundary and not draw it. Therefore, you'll have a solid pin on top. You'll be hollow in here. You drop that and it breaks off. You're going to go, why am I hollow in here? So you need to merge these as one body right here and have one consistent shell for this. Now, you can have multiple shells if you're building an assembly. And they can be independent so that you can put different durometers, the stiffness that you want on your material, and you can have different colors in something like an object machine. 
and you can apply the clearance or you can leave it out, either one. In this example of the fidget spinner, it is made up of several shells here. The ball bearings all have clearance in here, so it will roll around, but the logo pieces, there are no clearance, so they will stay in there and not slip out when this is built in one piece. So you can apply clearance, leave it in or leave it out. Last thing I want to touch on is part printing. We want to look at part orientation. This is important. We want to look at build times and some post-processing. Because we'll, after we've done all this work in here, we want to build the best quality part we can build. First thing is part orientation. This is one of the most important aspects of 3D printing. So positioning a part can really affect how your part comes up. So here's a, a, a mouse on here. It's got an organic shape on top. I actually have these parts I pass around when I'm doing a person-to-person -person talk. But this part you can, it was built at 13,000 layers, and you're going to see a bunch of layered lines and wood grain when you build it in this orientation. In this orientation, you change your profile to a contour, and you're not going to see it's almost a little bit straighter, and you're going to see it looks a lot better but where it dips here on the side, you're going to have some contour and what I call wood grain look in there. Building it standing up makes a huge difference. Everything now becomes an ellipse. Stack up it may take a little bit longer to build, and it will, but I'll save all my time by not having to sand it. And if I'm building parts overnight, I don't care if it takes seven hours to build or ten hours because I'm not there but I'll save all that process time in sanding it. And I'm going to show you some examples. But your build orientation is, think of it like stair steps. And then when you build stairs, you have a rise and a run. Anytime that your run becomes longer than your rise, that's an acute angle, you're going to have your run come out and be longer, and it's going to show up more pronounced on your surface. If you can make your rise taller, it shows up less. Let me give you some good examples here. So here's an F-22 that is uh, built laying down. And you can see how all these layer lines in here stack up. And if you just zoom up on it, you'll see even on the edge right here where it builds this edge, it wants to, it looks kind of rick-rack across there. Uh, but I can see my layers stacking up because my run here is much longer than my rise from layer to layer. So if I take that same part and I built it standing up, and these supports, by the way, uh, are, are, are inside advanced software that you can actually build the, draw these supports in there, and I built this part standing up. Now my surface finish looks so much better on here, much easier to sand, much truer to the form that I want and it's going to be much easier to clean. So when you compare these two, just for the surface quality, be aware that it's going to be a little bit different in time. Just to give you an idea, the time it took to build this, standing up, was only 15 minutes longer than laying down. And there's a reason for that, and we're going to talk about that reason. It has to do with the supports in here because here you see I didn't have to switch my tips back and forth to build supports. So I could just build my model all the way up. So let's look at that with the build times. So like I said, part orientation does matter. Which of these orientations builds the faster? Well, that depends on the technology you're using. But if you're using FPM technology, you're going to find that standing up is building faster. It will build faster because I'm not having to build support in between this overhang here. Here I have no overhangs. And even though it may be uh, four times taller, it actually will build an hour faster in the FDM standing up because I'm not having to swap my tips back and forth between uh, support material and uh, between model material here. So standing them up makes a difference. Now, it will change the strength properties, but for speed and build times, you can be misled just by saying, oh, I'll take the shortest Z high. So let's look at some build times here. Since we talked about build times, 
uh, we'll look at single parts and multiple parts. Here's a comparison, just building one part, and this is on several different machines out there. You'll see that the Stratus is F370 and the Stratus F450MC. Uh, uh, actually, we'll build one, the same part about the, at the same time, and even the Conix machines will build at the same time. However, some of your smaller machines that uh, don't are not as advanced, they have a little bit slower servo mo motors, and they can build slower uh, than you might want. Now, these are good machines, don't get me wrong, but just comparing the build time. So look at multiple parts on there. FDM is a, a constant linear time increase, whereas the object would steadily rise up to three parts. If I built that on the Conix 500, that is actually going to let me build three parts on a row, and then I would have to start a second row, and my head would print head will shift. So after I build three parts on a row, it's just a mild increase. And then if I have to start another row, it increases dramatically. And then building three more parts, I'm okay. Then I go to the seventh part, and it's going to go up. And then three more parts would be a would be a, a exponential rather than uh, be linear. That would be much lower to build. So let's talk about part printing. Uh, we're going to do the post processing now. This is the last one. One thing to know about FDM is bonding. And a lot of people think, oh, how do I glue this stuff together? You can actually make parts larger than your machine. Here you can see this is an engine block off of a Chevrolet uh, 283 uh, engine built in uh, three pieces. The two blue pieces were built at the same time on the machine, and the red piece was built at a different time on the machine. But I've also uh, put dovetails in there, and they're different size dovetails, so you can't get them mixed up. And so one part can go and fit into the other part. So here I'm not looking for a lot of slip clearance. I'm looking for a tight fit. I recommend about 3 thousandths of an inch to get you a tight fit there. And for bonding this, I will pretty much use acetone and bond it and melt it together for ABS and ASA. Now, if you're doing other materials, such as Altim and chemical resistant Antero, you might want to have to use a epoxy material to bond those together because acetone is not going to have an effect on them. Now, hot air welding is kind of interesting because you can do your hot air welding and it's just taking a heat gun localized to take a strand of leftover material and weld it across there. Then you can fill that in and then sand it off. Uh, you can paint the FDM model just as you would regular plastic, sand it up, use some Bondo or Auto Putty to fill it in, sand it up, put thin coats of paint in there on, on it, take a clear coat of lacquer, and you can protect against scratches and chip. For FDM, you can also do uh, epoxy sealing. You can either brush it on there or you can actually put it in a vacuum impregnation and have it soak up into the part. Let's talk about vapor smoothing. So if you're looking at this part right here, this is an ABS part, it works on ABS, ASA. This is an actual close-up of the part that built on the FDM machine. This is the same part built at the same time and vapor smooth. The way this works, we have a machine that's called a Stradivarius, and you, you, it works for ABS, ASA, and PCABS, and they're using the vapors from an acetone. You pour in about an inch of acetone. It actually will boil in here, making fumes. Fumes will rise. It will go up to the condenser coils, and it will turn it back to liquid, and it falls back down and repeats it. So you've got about an 18-inch range here that you can dip your part into. And when you dip your part in, it's going to actually melt the surface of it. It only takes about 5 to 10 seconds. and. Um, you get a much better surface finish on there. So I'm switching to PolyJet real quick. We're coming up on an hour. I'm going to go to PolyJet real quick. Uh, there's gluing for rigid parts, and there's some gluing for flexible parts here. So we, remember in PolyJet, we can do parts that are flexible. For PolyJet, you want to prime and paint your parts. There's actually a product out there made by um, uh, called Fusion. It's made for painting plastic. It really works well. But I'll, I'll always start, like to start with the first coat of 
gray primer. The primer fills in any surfaces, lets me do sanding, and also lets the adhesion stick really well for any lacquer or any other colors I might use on there. You can sand it. You can fill in blemishes here with auto uh, putty also. Use different grit sanding paper to, to work down a smoother finish. Make sure that you rinse it with water and buy another coat of primer if you need to. But primer really helps show up a lot of your blemishes quickly. Then you can paint the model, put a clear coat on there if you need to. Usually ten, ten, two thin coats are better than one thick coat on there. Clear parts. Vero Clear has been around for a long time. You can see the clarity of a Vero Clear part. One of the issues with clarity here is that as you built your part thicker, you got less clarity. Now they've introduced Vero Ultra Clear, and you can see the difference here on a thick, clear part. This is about a couple of inch and a half thick. Now with the Ultra Clear, it's very clear regardless of the thickness. So this is another post-processing to make clear parts here. If you're building clear parts and you build a bunch of small ones, these are going to be constantly exposed to UV light while this tall one is building in here. That's going to make them kind of yellow out the more UV light. A couple of things, you can either build these separately and save your tall part later, or you can make sure you use a matte finish on here because that will protect the surface from absorbing the UV light. You can also get clarity on your Vero Clear by what they call photo bleaching. And all these applications are uh, on the Stratasys website, and we can certainly get them for you if you have any questions on them. But here you can photo bleach this, by adding light to it, and then smooth it up, wet sand it for a clear coat. This part was just regular Vero Clear, the liver. You can dye and tint your polyjet parts. You have to use an alcohol-based aniline dye. It comes in a variety of colors. You can mix it up. Uh, but you don't want to exceed a ratio of three uh, parts dye and one part alcohol. It penetrates in a few seconds. It's very fast if you want to dye a part in there. Uh, use your clear parts if you want to dye in a special color. And you don't have a uh, J series machine. The J series will let you mix your colors as on the fly and you can get a much better looking color. And there I've covered all of it in an hour as fast as I could. I know I talked very quickly, but you can rewind this video and look at it again. So we've covered everything there. I just want to throw out, if you want to learn more, we've got a website out there. We do blogs uh, every day uh, on either CAD and or 3D printing. And we have webinars and seminars on our events. We have a newsletter you can sign up for and we have a YouTube channel. Thank you.